Hello, may I ask what your priorities are? Who or what comes first in your life? This is Search for Truth and we launch into a new Bible study subject for the next eight weeks with Brian Johnston, your Bible teacher. Brian's going to focus on the New Testament book called Romans, the Apostle Paul's letter to believers at the Church of God in Rome. I started by asking you about your priorities and when we look into the book of Romans we'll see that Paul's first priority is the gospel, the good news message. So we've called this series Putting the Gospel First. And now here's Brian with a general introduction. Thanks John. God used the Apostle Paul to make a major contribution to the writings that would come to make up the complete Bible, 66 books in all, 13 of them authored by Paul. His letter to the Galatian believers was the first of his letters to be written some 17 years after his conversion, so around about AD 50. The writing of this letter connects with his first missionary journey after Paul had returned back to base at Antioch and before his Jerusalem council visit. On his second missionary journey, he'd write the two letters to the Thessalonians, And on his third missionary journey, he wrote three letters, of which two were to the Corinthians and one to the Romans. Well, that brings us to Paul's letter to the Romans. Though not the first to be written, it has first place in the order in which we find Paul's writings in the New Testament listing of Bible books. So in that sense, it's been brought forward, as it were, pushed to the forefront, It's this that's given us our current title of putting the gospel first. Lots, perhaps all, of Paul's other letters were concerned in a more major way with fighting fires. That is, with correcting serious difficulties that had arisen in the very first churches of God in the first century. It's sobering to think of the problems that existed in those churches. But in one sense, we might even say it was good that these churches were so imperfect because these problems gave the impetus for the rich teaching that Paul poured into the letters that he wrote to them. There's not only the clarity of the correction that was administered, but above all, it's the way Christ gets exalted in marvellous sections of these writings by Paul. Among his letters, Paul urges his readers to have a mentality that was suited to their identity their new identity in Christ. He encourages them to set their minds on things much higher than the mundane things of this life. Their focus was to be on heaven's throne, where Christ had taken his seat upon his ascension after being raised from the dead. From the first Christian sermon preached by the Apostle Peter, we see how this thought of the enthroned and exalted Christ had gripped the first Christians. It's worth pausing at that thought to ask ourselves, where do my thoughts wander when my mind is not having to engage with other practical matters? When you read Paul's letters, it's clear that his thoughts always escaped away to the gospel. The good news of what God has done for us through Christ at the cross was the passion of his life. How fitting then that whereas Galatians was the first letter to be written chronologically, the letter to the Romans with its gospel content is the first of Paul's letters that we encounter canonically. That is, it's first in order as we find them presented in our Bibles. Even if you're familiar already with the gospel of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preached, I hope you'll join with me for these studies as we follow Paul's expert and spirit-filled defence of the gospel. He'll soon be standing for the defence of the gospel before Caesar's tribunal at the heart of the Roman Empire. But here, in the pages of his letter to the Romans, pages in which he anticipates his visit there, He already sets out for all time such a wonderfully orderly defence of the gospel that it squarely faces up to and systematically defeats every conceivable objection to it. It's been remarked by others that there are eight main sections to this letter, so I'll make use of them if I may. 
we start now with the first of the eight, that is, with the introduction that occupies Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Before we come to the text itself, perhaps it's worth sharing a historical note by way of introduction to this great letter. It's one that demonstrates how God's word, as found in this letter, has transformed the lives of countless men and women down through the centuries since Paul wrote it. We start then with the true story about the spiritual crisis that assailed a professor of literature struggling to live down his turbulent past. The preaching of Ambrose had brought him to conviction and, unable to find rest, he went out into the sunshine of his back garden in Milan, Italy. Under a tree he was breaking his heart when he heard some kids playing outside, chanting a little song, Pick up and read! Pick up and read! Wondering if this could be the answer for him, he picked up and read from Romans chapter 13, which happened to be lying handy. The words he read was from verse 11 of that chapter were these, Not in riots and drunken parties, it said, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was how the famous Augustine got saved in the year AD 386. Nearly 1,200 years later, and this time in Germany, a monk of the order of that same Augustine was undergoing his very own spiritual crisis. Regarding this letter to the Romans, he said, Night and day I thought over it until I understood that the righteousness of God is of such a nature that he justifies us by grace and mercy through faith. Upon that, I felt I was reborn and had entered paradise through an open door. The name of this man who entered through that open door, the door, so to speak, of Romans chapter 1 verse 17, was of course Martin Luther. And within two years, in 1517, he in turn opened the door on the Protestant Reformation. Then, on the eve of of the 24th of May, 1738, John Wesley went, in his own words, very unwillingly to a Moravian meeting in the Aldersgate Street where someone was reading Luther's foreword to the letter to the Romans. Wesley would later say, at about quarter to nine, while hearing about the change God works in our heart through faith in Christ, Wesley acknowledged, I found my own heart strangely warmed. I felt I trusted on Christ alone for salvation. And he received the assurance that his sins were taken away. And so began the 18th century English revival, which historians note had a profound effect upon the country at large. And so there we have an interlocking chain of events in which Paul's letter to the Romans changed influential lives down through history, as it has done for countless others, of course. Well, we should introduce the text of the Bible now using Paul's own introduction to his letter to Rome. At both the introduction and at the conclusion of his letter to the Romans, Paul uses the expression, the obedience of faith. Please make no mistake about it. Faith that's real will produce obedience. Here's how Paul opens his letter to the Romans. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his apostles in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his namesake. The gospel is the gospel of God concerning his Son. It's divine as to its author and subject. But I want you to particularly notice there the mention of the obedience of faith. This was the goal of Paul's preaching and that of the other apostles. 
Such a thing as easy believism, just believe, wasn't known to Paul. That wasn't the essence of Paul's preaching. The gospel, once accepted, should shape our whole life. True faith is obedience involving surrender, repentance, commitment and submission to the authority or lordship of Jesus Christ. Bible scholars inform us that this is describing the obedience that springs from faith. Another agrees and adds, the obedience of faith is the obedience which characterises and proceeds from faith. The point is, real faith is characterised by nothing less than obedience. The obedience of faith is our yielding ourselves to belief in God's saving message which is the highest of all obedience, yielding to the message and surrendering to Christ. Faith, self-renouncing trust in Jesus Christ, is obedience to the gospel command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And that faith in Jesus Christ initiates a believer into a life of obedience to Jesus Christ. Faith is no mere notional or mental assent to biblical propositions. Real faith always has works of obedience. The great reformers would tell us it's faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves us is never alone. It's never without obedience to the Lordship of Christ our Saviour. We should allow Paul the last word in introducing his letter on the fundamental truths of the Christian message or gospel. He says this in verses 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. Having revisited there the verse that God used to bring conviction to the heart of Martin Luther on this introduction to the Bible letter to the Romans. I hope you enjoyed today's talk and I'd like to remind you there's a transcript book of all the talks in this series which would be helpful if you want to pursue further study. So please let me remind you how you can freely receive a copy. Firstly, it's available online and you can obtain one by downloading a copy from churchesofgod.info forward slash media. Alternatively, you can write to us and request that a hard copy book be posted out to you. Just ask for the title, Putting the Gospel First. And don't forget to include your postal address so we know where to send the book. You can use email or the post, and here's our address. Search for Truth, Hayes Press, The Barn, Flaxlands, Royal Wootton Bassett, Swindon, SN4 8DY UK. Our email address is sft at churchesofgod.info. Many thanks indeed for the pleasure and privilege of your company today. Next week, God willing, we have the second study in this eight-part series, so do join me if you can, same time next week. But for now, it's goodbye and very best wishes from our Bible teacher, Brian, our producer, David, our singers and me, John. So see you again soon, and in the meantime, we wish you God's richest blessings.